episode, another special edition of the CG Central Podcast. If you're a typical listener, thanks for joining us. If you are a new listener, thanks for joining us as well. We appreciate all of you guys checking out the show. we got a very exciting guest on the show today, Joe Gallo from Merrimack, the head coach of the Warriors, joining us today. And Brad, you know, we've seen a lot of these D1 transition schools, um, whether they were from the Northeast 10, like Merrimack with UMass Lowell and Bryant over the last you know 10 years or so some some schools outside that realm Grand Canyon kind of in a class of its own because the amount of money they're spending but Northern Kentucky Cal Baptist you know some of these teams have had some success it'll be really interesting to get some insight uh from Coach Gallo about what he's doing to prepare for that and how they can try to hopefully have some of the same success that other uh these transition schools have had yeah it's gonna be tough because I mean they're a division two NCAA tournament like a consistent force, right? Like they're always in it. They're always in the mix. Um, and, you know, this year, returning all the guys that they do, you know, they, they were in, in in for a pretty successful year if if they had stayed in a Division two. Now they make the jump and they can't even qualify for the NCAA tournament uh, for four years um, as part of the uh, transition. But, you know, a, a team that, you know, returns so much and it would have been so good in a Division two. You know, maybe they could push for like a CIT or a CBI bid, um, and you know the neck is always there for the taking. Uh, a conference that that has a lot of turnover and and attrition and just general, um, you know, pretty pretty wild swings. Now that Robert Morris is kind of come back to earth. Merrimack, based just outside of Boston, um, northern northern Massachusetts, up near the New Hampshire border, is a you know, it's a, it's a school that's been known for hockey, um, that, that has been D1 in hockey for quite some time, but announced on my birthday last year, uh, September 10th, 2018, that they were headed to D1, had one final season in the Division II ranks. They won the Northeast 10 title that year uh, for the first time in 19 years and then make the move up this year. So, um, you know, for a guy who's an alum of the program and Joe Gallo who played there and then was an assistant, went up to Robert Morris, recruited Marquise Reed and Rodney Pryor and some of the other you know, stars that they had that transferred up, uh, comes, gets a chance to come back to his alma mater. It's pretty cool. And, you know, can you imagine, you know, bringing the program that you played in or you played at up to the Division One level? I think that'd have to be, you know, one of the coolest things for a head coach would be to lead somewhere you played all the way up and really into a new era as a program. Absolutely. And, I mean, they have a star in a – Javaris Hayes and you know returning so much of their team so they're they're certainly going to be a team to track um not not only because they're moving up to a division one but um personally for me I mean I I I live in uh, Massachusetts they're playing Providence this year so um definitely a team to uh, keep an eye on they're also playing Northwestern on November the 8th which will be a fun one I will be there that's the first Friday of the college basketball season it's Northwestern's opener not sure if uh, Merrimack will play one first because they haven't announced their full schedule yet, but it will be pretty pretty exciting to, to see how they fare against some of these high major teams um, and then into to Northeast Conference play. So without fur- further ado, let's get into the interview. Uh, I was there. Brad, you sent in some questions as always. We spoke with Merrimack head men's basketball coach Joe Gallo. We're excited to be joined today by Merrimack head coach Joe Gallo. Coach Gallo has led Merrimack to three consecutive NCAA tournaments at the D2 level, led his team to an NE10 title last season, and now gets the chance to lead the program into its transition to the D1 level, which begins this year. Coach, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm excited about it. First question for you, you you played at Merrimack, you were an assistant there, now you're the head coach. For those listening across the country, they may not know anything or not much about your school, your program, how would you describe the place you're at right now? You know what? It's, um, it, it really is the full package uh, as a place. Um, and, and it's funny you bring that up because even, you know, when, with recruits and, and families, um, you know, when we go into our pitch and talk about the place, um, I always tell them this is, you know, this is truly from experience and, and truly from the heart. It's, um, you know, a place I played at and then I came back and as an assistant coach and then as a head coach, so um, there's obviously something that keeps you know bringing me back, um, and it really is, um, you know, it's a 
that the school has grown a ton. When I graduated in 2004, we were just under 2,000 undergrads, and you know, beginning of this this fall, we'll have just over 4,000. Um, but it's you know 20 20 miles from Boston. Um, I always say you can be to the city in Boston 30 minutes, but you could also be to a beach in 30 minutes as well, which is you know, two things that uh, two things I really enjoy, and most people do. Um, you know, the, the good academics uh, with a, a variety of majors to choose from. Um, you know, a really beautiful campus uh, with uh, you know a lot of campus life, a lot going on. Um, our, our, our players love it. You know, no, this is a place that you know with all the you know, transferring that's going on a lot of, across the country. Um, you know, hopefully this this doesn't change, but we haven't been hit with that much because it, it's just a place that people come and enjoy because of you know the relationships that are built between players and coaches and professors, and uh, it really is just a, a cool community type of place. And for you, as someone who has so many ties to the college from before being the head coach, how cool is it to be the guy who gets to lead them into D one? It's it's great, you know, and it's something that, um, you know, you all, people always say like, what what was your dream job, and was it Duke or the Knicks or, you know, it's this is a place that I always knew, um, you know, one day I'd love to come back and lead. So it, it really is, um, you know, not just cliche. It it truly is a dream come true. We talked a little bit about you know selling recruits. What's the difference in selling recruits now that you're you're D one? What's what type of education process has to go in? You know, with recruits, with families that, hey, you know, this is th- this is different now. And obviously not to, to knock the D2 level, there's a ton of talent there. But, you know, we hear a lot about kids who are chasing that D1 offer, chasing that D1 opportunity. You know, is, is there something now that you can sell that you didn't have before? You know what, just that label and it's it's um, being at both levels. I, I do think it is. It, it's sad at times that people, um, you know, now I'm on the other side of it and I am on the division one side. But when you were division two coach and people were holding out for that division one offer and I didn't necessarily think that was always the right way to go about it either but um just having just being division one it just gets you you know in that door a little bit quicker you know those first couple conversations you know I you can I could speak till I'm blue in the face as a division two coach how we've been to three straight NCAA tournaments and we won the league and you know just using the 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 words Division One, I, I think, get you that much further along uh, over how many championships you won in the past. And I don't, you know, whether that's right, wrong, or indifferent, um, that's just what it is today. So, um, you know, right off the bat, it's, oh, you're Division One, and, and people perk up and they're interested right from the beginning, where it might have took a little bit more selling, um, you know, in prior years. And we've obviously seen the success of some D2 transfers at the D1 level, guys like Derek White, Max Struess, guys who played at the high major level after coming from D2. You know, how much of a talent gap do you think there is between the league where you're coming from and, and where you headed now, the NEC? You know what? Not a ton. Um, I think there's a little bit of a um, little bit of size, just positional size, not necessarily like a, a speaking of a, a five man or that type of size, just across the board um, and, and some athleticism. But, um, you know, it, it, the, the gap is not, you know, any 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 successful program. Um, usually has, I don't know, I'd say three to four guys that could probably play at a level a little bit higher. So, you know, when you're, um, you know, when you're winning the NEC, you probably have a few guys that could, you know, play in the CAA A-10. When you're winning the Northeast 10, you have guys that can, can play Division One basketball. So um, some of our better players, I don't think it'll be much of an adjustment at all. You know, a little bit of physicality, um, but we've been up here, you know, for the last six weeks of the summer getting ready and lifting and getting our bodies ready for that side of it but for, based off just ba- basketball talent I, I think the gap is has narrowed quite a bit and what are some things that, that people might not realize about a, a transition like this I mean I think a lot of people would say okay you got to up the recruiting and, and get players in who can who can play at the at the upper levels you gotta you know obviously increase you know financial support and, and get everything where it needs to be but what are some things that maybe fly under the radar in a transition process like this that you've been working on getting your team and your program uh, to a level of? Some of those things you mentioned, you know, there, there's some added cost. You know, it's not cheap to have um, 13 guys up for summer school. And, you know, right off the bat, you go from 10 to 13 scholarships. Um, some of those added costs that people, I think, just, you know, take for granted. Um, but but as far as how, how we operate on a day-to-day basis, um, you know, if you ask my returners, what's the difference between, you know, 
today and three years ago of how we operate on a day to day basis, they would tell you absolutely not. Um, you know, I think we're we're a day by day type of program, just continuing to, to try and get better and um, you know, build within our system. So then, who we play is is who we play. You know, we try and prepare for the best teams on our roster, regardless. Um, so our guys wouldn't even necessarily know that we're even going through a transition uh, outside of you know being able to work with our guys this summer, which has been great. Um, but I think it's just you know some of those little odds and ends. And I mean, you'd be. I started filling out a budget forecast a few months ago, and you know it's it's uh it's about four times the cost just for referees um, <laughs> every home game. So there there are some you know uh, recruiting packets you go on the road in the summer, and it's you know 150 dollars for a non-division one school and 600 dollars for a division one school. So there are those you know add up costs that just get built in right off the bat, uh, price to doing business in division one. And how beneficial is it for you to have spent time in the NEC, Robert Morris, you know, giving you a little familiarity with the league, everything around, you know, where you're headed already? Is, is there that's something that, that helped you throughout this process so far of, of transitioning? I think so. Um, and, and I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, I think it'll help, you know, on the basketball side, you know, we, you know we've played against some of these teams. Um, you know, my, my assistant coach, Phil Gaetano, was a you know three-year starter. Um, at, at Sacred Heart, which was in the NEC not too long ago. I actually coached against him. I was an assistant coach at Rob Morris while he was playing. So um, there'll be a lot of familiarity, you know, from a basketball sense of how, how teams play, styles. But I, I think it's definitely um, – it probably helps the most recruiting. Um, I think sometimes guys get – you know, guys get jobs at different levels, and it takes a couple of years to figure out what that – what a good player in that league you know, you know, looks like or at that level looks like. And I think from being there and having the experience, you know, doing a lot of the recruiting at Robert Morris, um, I think that'll that'll help me the most early on is just, you know, being to identify what a good player looks like in that league. I'm talking a little bit about recruiting. You bring in a six man class this year. Um, you know, how important is that first class and, and what does that team that group look like for you coming in this year? Who are some guys you can maybe contribute right away? You know what? We 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 got a little bit of everything with that class. Um, you know, early on, I think uh, Jordan Miner, who's you know, he's just much different than anything we've had here as a as a Division Two. He's you know, six seven, pushing six eight, two hundred twenty five pounds, and super athletic and aggressive. And um, I, we're going to need him to, to play some minutes early on because we just legitimately don't have anyone else like him in our program. Um, Michael Daring is a local. Um, he's from brighten up this way. Uh, really good shooter, good athlete. Uh, we have uh, Ethan Helwig from uh, Chicago area, uh, 6'4", uh, shot maker. Uh, Ziggy Reed is someone that we think, um, again, another guy who's just a little bit different than we had. Uh, he's from Baltimore area, you know, 6'5", 6'6", 235 pounds. So we've added um, some physicality that we're probably missing another guy Jordan McCoy from New Jersey is another one of those just kind of six five rangy athletes so um, we we look a little bit different I'd say than we have in the past um, you know these guys still got to prove their worth and put the work in on the basketball side but I think um, our immediate needs were some just kind of bigger longer athletes um, and then the sixth guy Jalen Davis is at a Cardozo High School in New York and uh, we're actually going to redshirt him which will be big for him but he's another guy six four guard um, so we just added a bunch of uh, positional size really across the board. Combine that that youth with a, a star point guard in, in Juvaris Hayes. I watched a little film on him prepping for the show, and he was just so impressed with, with how dynamic he is at both ends. You know, great defender, can really pass. You know, how important was landing him at the start of your time at Merrimack, and you know, how great is it to have him as you make this transition to have a senior point guard who can you know play up against you know, for my money pretty much anybody in the country. Yeah, and it's it's um it's obviously great for us, um, but I, I'm really happy for him because, um, you know, I think he's got a bright future, you know, ahead of him even even after college, and um, you know, now he'll get to you know some of those numbers he puts up. Some people may think it's a little lofty because it wasn't against Division One or whatever people may think, but um, now he'll have a chance to go and you know try and do the things he's done in the past against a little higher level of competition. But it, but it's been great. I came in when I got the job. 
Um, Javaris committed probably about a month after I got the job. And, you know, we, we, we kind of went through some bumps and bruises and learning curves together. It was my first time as a head coach. And, uh, we asked a lot of him. He, uh, he came from St. Anthony high school in Jersey city and played on a really good team with, you know, five, six other division one players. So we actually probably asked more of him, um, he had a bigger role with us as a freshman than he probably did in, in four years with his high school. So it was a little bit different for him to kind of take on the role that we needed him to take on. But, you know, he, he's handled it great. And, you know, he's had a really great career. And, uh, it's it's huge that we know we have, you know, that, that point guard position going Division One. With, with Like you said, you know, I'd really be shocked if he's not a first, second team all-league guy. And, you know, I had to touch on his defense a little bit. He averages almost four steals a game last season. You know, it seems like your team as a whole really emphasizes forcing turnovers and, and winning that turnover battle. You know, what's the mindset of your defense as a whole? How how do you guys structure it and, um, you know, able to have so much success in, in creating turnovers and, and really dominating that area of the game? So we play, um, it, it's probably 99.99% um, extended 2-3 zone, um, which you know, most people wouldn't think you can create the amount of turnovers and, and not give up, you know, we, we give up a really low number of three-point shots as well. But, um, you know, we're, we're very extended, almost um, Syracuse-ish, uh, but we, we played a little bit different. We don't have, we're not blessed with the length and the size that they have. Um, so if you were to watch ours versus theirs, we're flying around a lot more. and um, It looks a little bit more chaotic. Um, but that's what we're trying to create. We're trying to create kind of chaotic possession and get people out of rhythm. But um, it, it's it's more organized chaos on that and on our end because we know where we're running and we know the slides and we know where we're going on each pass and when penetration comes and when it goes to the high post. So it may look a little wacky on film and like we're running around like you know, chickens with our heads cut off, but it, it, it really is all in the plan. Um, you know, that's what we try and do. We're trying to we try and win every game plus five in the turnover battle. And, um, you know, we feel like if, if we can do that um, and limit teams three point attempts and, and naturally playing zone, we're not going to foul a ton. You know, we're kind of playing the analytics side of things and really you know, narrowing ways that you can score against us. You mentioned a little bit about, you know, looking at analytics, how much do the advanced stats and, you know, things of that nature impact your coaching decisions, your recruiting decisions, you know, everything that goes into running your program. You know, it's such a hot topic nowadays. How much do you do you use that stuff uh, in, well, in your day to day? We go we, we just use the typical stuff. You know, we I, I wouldn't say we're we're over the top with it, but we're big, you know, points per possession, turnover rate. Um, you know, and, and we do, you know, we, we wanna, you know, probably like anyone, we want to make threes and we don't want to give threes up. You know, we want to take care of the ball and we want to take the ball from you. So um, we, we do use them. Um, I, I started using it, you know, when we, my first year, um, you know, we were winning games and our, our field goal percentage defense wasn't necessarily great. Uh, and that's when we kind of started going to the points per, per possession. And it just made more sense that, you know, we were turning people over a ton. Um, you know, we were probably, we weren't, dead last we were like middle of the pack field goal percentage defense and that was a number you know that's such an old school number that all oh, that's all anyone used to ever look at um but when you're turning people over 16 17 times a game and a high percentage of those shots that people are making are twos um you know we were always top you know top couple in the league points per possession and then last year we really um took it to another level you know, i think we were one or two in, in the country in defensive efficiency what what type of expectations do you do you go into this transition with? Because obviously we've seen some programs have a lot of success. We've seen some programs take a little longer. You know, do you compare yourself to some of the other teams that have done this this move over the last five ten years, or is it really you know this is where we are and and we're going to evaluate ourselves pretty independently? I I think to the the latter part of that, um, you know, UMass Lowell did it and going from the Northeast Ten and. Ryan did it as well, um, but I don't know. I, I just I'd like to think we're we're unique, and uh, you know, in this situation, it, it was um, you know people always are curious what what is the difference between you know high level Division two and Division one. Uh, you know, we we would have been 
probably unanimous number one in the Northeast 10 preseason this year, whether that means, you know, for whatever it's worth, you know, that's where we would have been picked. So uh, we're in a very healthy state um, as far as a program. Um, so this will truly show, you know, what is the difference? Because here you have a team that, you know, we were in a middle of the road division two team, um, you know, we're probably a preseason top 10 in the country. Um, so I think where we are, I, I, I just don't, the mindset is is to, to win every day and, and win every possession and then let the wins take care of themselves. So I never go through a schedule at the beginning and say, you know, that's a win, that's a loss, that's a win, that's a loss. We just take it day by day. And I don't, you know, I stopped practice the other day and it was like, I don't know, like it's just business as usual. It's who do we play next? You know, we have this team in an exhibition game, then we open up with Maine and it's like, you know, whether it's Maine or St. Anselm or Bentley or Stone Hill or whoever it may be, um, our expectation is, is to try and win every cut, win every catch, win every closeout, win every possession. Um, and then, you know, you hope at the end of that, the score takes care of itself. All right, last question for you, Coach. You know, where would you assess you're at right now? It, you know, around a year ago when this was first announced, okay, we're going to go D1. Where you're at right now, do you think that's ahead of schedule, right at where you want it to be? You know, still a little more work to do. What do you, what do you assess from this first? about 11 months of, of officially being on the D1 track? I think we're, uh, we're, I think we're heading in the right direction. I think we're probably about where I thought we would be. Um, you know, like I said, we were able to, you know, we were fortunate enough to right off the bat, you know, have our guys up for summer school. And we got, you know, our full allotment of scholarships right away. Um, you know, I think we were able to attract some pretty good players and capitalize on the announcement and the excitement of it, and hopefully build on that momentum going forward. But I would say we're probably right where I'd expect us to be. You know, we're, we're still in the process, you know, over the next couple of years of, you know, adding more staffing and, and getting up to speed with, you know, full staff, and hopefully some, um, you know, facility upgrades around the corner coming soon. So um, for just being 11 months in and not even playing a Division One game yet, I think we're probably about where I thought we would be. Coach, we appreciate your time. You know, good luck with the transition. Good luck with the upcoming season. I know I'll be watching. Awesome. Thanks for having me. And there it is. That's the interview with Coach Gallo. We once again appreciate him taking the time to join the show. It's always much appreciated um, to both the coaches and the media relations staff for you know, working with us and making sure we get everything squared away, set it up on time. And you know, they were very helpful in setting up the interview. And I thought a really insightful chat, both you know more big picture with the D1 versus D2 differences and also, you know, looking at his team and, you know, the style of defense that they play, the superstar Andrew Boris Hayes, who can play pretty much anywhere in the country. I mean, it, it was a really fun chat, and we appreciate Coach Gallo coming on. Absolutely. I mean, the uh, most most interesting stuff for me was, like, the uh, minutia in uh, regards to the Division One transition. Like, the refs are going to cost more. Uh, I mean, the NEC is going to have more travel than the Northeast 10, but... It's one of the more centrally located leagues, but still, I mean, he said like the refs are four times as much. Um, you know, there's all these costs involved that you wouldn't uh, even realize, like like from an outside perspective. And and, and for me, that's stuff's more interesting than um, you know to uh, hear from the coach, like 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 these personal insights that you really couldn't get anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of little things about the transition that I think he made a really good point of. You know, summer school, and first off, to have Merrimack be supportive enough to year one of it, commit to those things. Make sure you're committed to pay for 13 scholarships. You're committed to pay for summer school for all your guys. You're committed to, you know, all those little expenses. But, I mean, you talk about, you know, little gap, little gaps like that. I mean, an entire summer of your kids being in the weight room every single day with your strength and conditioning coach and with your coaching staff and, and getting practice over the summer. And th those things are really, really important for a young program and for, for someone that's developing, you're, you're going to bring in a six man freshman class. I mean, you're still building out a staff and you know, support staff and everything that helps you win at the vision one level. But you know, just to have things like summer school and 13 full scholarships allotted, I think that's, that's huge. And one of the things that you have to remind yourself when you look at these teams in transition, especially a, a school like Merrimack that is, you know, 4,000 students, it's not grand Canyon with, um, uh, just boatloads of cash, boatloads of students able to spend, you know, several hundred thousand dollars on Marvin Menzies to be an assistant coach five years in. I mean, they have to be careful financially. And so um, 
the commitment there from the beginning has been important for Merrimack. And I know Coach Gallo mentioned at the end of the interview, hope, hoping to get some facilities upgrades and support, support staff in. Hopefully that comes as well, because those are the little things that help you win in college basketball beyond just, you know, player development and, you know, recruiting and, and the little, the big stuff that you see on a, uh, on a national scale. Yeah. Cause especially with the scholarships, I mean, that's something that's, that's really taken for granted. I know when a Syracuse got, got their scholarships cut from 13 to 10, um, for, you know, with, with the NCAA rulings, um, you know, that, that was really uh, detrimental to them. You can't really miss on a kid, right? Like, is it, is it such a limited window? Um, and, and for a team moving up from division one, from division two to, to division one, you know, I didn't even realize that they only had 10, 10 scholarships. And I'm sure that they, you know, they can add more, more co- coaches to the staff too. So, I mean, it's, you know, all, all those little things, you know, make a world of a difference. And, you know, for them to compete um, in the neck, you know, all all other was it ten or eleven neck teams have have been working with thirteen scholarships, and you know, uh, luckily for uh, Merrimack, they have a strong enough freshman class to kind of compensate for that. Yeah, he talked about adding positional size and length was the biggest thing with this group because you know they play that zone defense and. To play from the Division two to the Division one level, one of the things he said was most important was just getting some length and size into the program. He certainly does that. Uh, a couple of guys who really fit that billing, you know, Ziggy Reed, Jordan McCoy, and then Jordan Miner, who he mentioned off the top as a guy who wasn't like anybody they'd had in their program and a guy that they're probably not landing if they're not Division one, right? I mean, if you look at the, you know, other programs – where Neps- all Nepsack guys are going, and you've got James Boonite was on the same all Nepsack team as he was. And he goes to UConn, and then you've got Daniel Bowie and um, Wilvins Levick, who are both going high major, Bryson Goodeen, who's going to Syracuse. I mean, those guys were on the same, you know, all Nepsack class AA team as Jordan Miner. So to land him, a 6'7, 6'8 guy who can be physical up front and help them down low against some of the you know, bigger guys than the NEC. It's definitely a guards league, but there are still some bigs that they would have had to deal with. Uh, that's pretty big. So, um, you know, some recruiting wins to be able to capitalize on the excitement. You know, it's it's a balance, I think, with recruits because obviously you can't sell a tournament, but you can sell a chance to build something and, and the chance to be on the ground floor and a chance to play. And I think that, I think the balance there was pretty interesting to, to talk to him about, you know, recruiting as a whole as a D1 versus a D2 and, and some of the, the feedback you get on the recruiting trail because, you know, it, you hear all the time this this kid waiting for that D1 offer, and then you read all these tweets from people who are like, oh, you know, any level is great. You know, we love scholarships. It's all about getting an education. And, like, obviously that's the truth, but that's just not what's in the minds of most 18-year-olds. And so to have that D1 sell, I know he talked about, you know, I, I could talk until I'm blue in the face about making the NCAA tournament every year at the D2 level, but there's just nothing like D1 in that label, so. Uh, I thought the whole really insight on recruiting, whether it's individual players or um, just the differences between D1 and D2 recruiting as a whole, was something worth noting. Yeah, and uh, he he seemed to think, and I think the the early results have kind of bear this out that you know it's you're you're in a more advantageous recruiting position to be ineligible for the NCAA tournament for a, for a a recruiting class's whole you know lifespan, right? Like. For, for the four years than it is to be like a successful division two team, which, which I found uh, really surprising because, you know, even though like a, a team in the neck, especially a team that's, you know, middle of the pack, um, the, the chances of you making the NCAA tournament are like probably less than 10%, right? It's one is auto bid or nothing. And then, you know, to win the three or four games that, that, that you need, it, it's like such a slim, um, sequence of events that like needs to occur yet you know taking away even the possibility of of those slim uh you know stars aligning i i thought that 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 would have a bigger impact than it seems like it does i think it's probably just about you know the opportunity to you know be a part of something at its ground floor right i mean he coach gala talked at the top about how this is a school that's grown quite a bit that you know, 15 years ago, he couldn't have seen this when he was graduating. And I think you, when you can sell a vision of, 
you know, when you graduate in, when you look back in 10 years, you know, this could be a very successful NEC program. This could be more than an NEC, NEC program. This could be a MAC program or a, you know, CAA. We don't know where the alignment's going to go. Um, that, that it's a school that's growing, it's a program that's growing, and you can be a, be a part of it. We saw even with grad transfers, Brandon Boyd committed to Cal Baptist to play over, um, you know, some bigger schools. And Cal Baptist is ineligible this year because of that transition process there in year two. I thought that was really interesting uh, as well. You know, kid signing away his only chance to play in the NCAA tournament to be a part of something and be a part of a coaching staff and a culture that that, that is successful. And I think that's something – you know, really fascinating in, in terms of how you sell it. I think that I think it's really about what it is, though. It's all about how you sell that uh, to recruits. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, hopefully that you know they can make a CBI or a CIT, and uh, we can see them play some some postseason basketball. But that's certainly putting the cart the cart before the horse because it's going to be interesting to see you know how a a upper tier uh, Division two team. I think coach said that they're going to be. Like if if they were still in Division Two, they would be projected to be like a borderline top ten team. You know how that stacks up in a Division One, and you know the neck is probably the thirtieth out of thirty two in terms of conferences. So um, it, th- this will be a really interesting litmus test. Well, and we've seen individual players at the D two level, guys like Derek White, Max Struess. Uh, come up and be so successful, even Duncan Robinson from the D3 ranks, you know, be so successful at high major programs. I think a guy who could set the world on fire a little bit is Jubaris Hayes. He's a guy who averaged over 19 points, close to seven assists, close to seven rebounds, and almost four steals a game. Um, he's the catalyst of their 2-3 zone defense that they play. Um, you know, the way he was being described almost sounded like a, like a Matisse Thibel who could score. I mean, he is... Just so so dynamic as a as a ball handler, um, but also kind of wreaking havoc in their chaotic two three zone defense. Um, and so he's going to be a really fun player to watch and at that level and see how he how he fares. He's a guy who played on a really successful high school team with a ton of D one talent. If if he transferred up last year after averaging like eighteen and eight assists his uh, sophomore year of D two. There would have been a lot of schools involved, and he didn't choose to do that. He chose to stick it out of Merrimack, and the opportunity to, you know, this year show it at the D1 level is is pretty cool for him. And he's he's the type of guy who can be a centerpiece to this and be an all conference guy who can lead you into at least being competitive in, in in the NEC, regardless of you know where the rest of the talent level is. But I think the talent level is pretty good, and the coaching staff really good. I think they'll continue to win by forcing turnovers. The NEC is a very turnover prone league in general. That's something I've noticed. You know, whenever I watch MAC teams play the NEC, I always notice you know, there's a lot of turnovers by those NEC guards, a lot of young guards, and I think having an experienced backcourt with guys who know how to force turnovers, who have a really solid defensive system, could wreak some havoc early on. Yeah, and then in terms of Division two and three transfers, we have another one, Austin Hutchison, uh, going from. Wesleyan, I think, to Illinois as a sit one play to average like twenty or twenty two points a game last year as a sophomore in a in a division three. So or, or maybe they're a division two. I, I don't thirty three exactly remember. Or, or a, a division three. But I mean he was a big scorer and another uh test case, you know going to show you know, he was so productive and, and he goes straight straight to the high major level. You know, besides Illinois Notre Dame was involved, Creighton, Marquette. Um, so now with uh, Javaris Hayes, I mean, if if all these other guys are going high major, then you know he's he's probably close to a, a high major talent himself. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, he can't really shoot. That's the one area where he struggled. He only hit nine. Um, he only had nine threes last season, but you know he he's very dynamic with the ball. He can really pass. He you know, was on pace to set some records at the D2 level if he had stuck it out for one more year, but uh, Merrimack decided to leave, so he couldn't. Uh, so it's very you know, very exciting to see what a guy like him can do at the next level. But, you know, like we said, it's going to be a really interesting test case. It's going to be something I'm watching, and I think I think they're ready. I think they've got a really good young coach who's got things going in the right direction. They've got you know, the talent, both experienced and younger guys. So it's not like they'll have this year with Hayes and then take a huge step back. 
you know, I think they're they're really well positioned for this D1 transition in a way that other schools weren't. You know, North, North Alabama made the transition this year. They had a they had to hire a new coach because they had struggled their previous year. We saw a similar thing with Bryant had hired a new coach right before. UMass Lowell was 15 and 13 when they made the transition. Um, so to be in a spot where you're one of the elite teams in the country and be able to transition, that's where Cal Baptist was. And Cal Baptist was pretty much a 500 team in the WAC last year. I think obviously they added uh, Milana Qua, who is a stud, but I think it shows the ability of a D2 team to, to compete. And I think we'll see similar results this year in, a, in the NEC where they can go, you know, maybe like eight, like eight and 12, nine and 11 wouldn't be unrealistic at all. Yes, yeah, sir. Cert- certainly wouldn't be surprised. I know last year that, you know, there was a big um, kind of cluster, you know, because not, not every team makes the uh, conference tournament. And, and it was like a down, down to the wire race for the last few spots. So, I mean, I don't know how the neck handles it. I, I presume they won't be playing in the conference tournament because they have enough teams. They're not um, allowed to, to play not... in the conference tournament now. Okay. Some some conferences they do, though, right? Was it the – maybe the WAC or the Summit League where it was just like if – A-Sun if the, was doing it too. If, if the ineligible team makes it to the championship, then the other team just gets the bid. Yeah, but they just play it out because – and like the ineligible team could win the championship, but they just wouldn't get the bid. Yeah. Which would be interesting enough, but I think I don't think there's really any need for it, right? Like if you're not eligible, why are you playing? You're just taking a spot away from someone who could steal the bid, um, and especially in a league like the NEC, you never know who could be that team. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's probably the right move, even though some some leagues kind of have to do it by necessity, and there's also some that do it. Like I know, I think Stetson was ineligible because of academics, so they were like a one year ineligible and so they played anyway but then they made it to the, all the way to championship game and nearly won the thing but it didn't matter because they couldn't dance anyway anything else on uh, merrimack uh yes quick question for you you were at the pan am game um the the scrimmage juvaris hayes was on that select team do you remember anything about watching him I remember that you pointed out, you know, that that he he posts like big numbers, um, but just just the overall kind of talent talent disparity between the Big East team and the select team, especially at at the guard spots. You know, the guards didn't really stand out. Um, I think John John Mooney from uh, from Notre Dame was clearly the best player on the court. A uh, few, few of the guards, you know, hit a shot here or there, but. Um, just the Big East was like too too long and too athletic, so it kind of um, kind of skewed it. All right, good to know. Well, that will conclude our interview with Coach Joe Gallo. Once again, we appreciate him coming on the show. Uh, check out our other coach interviews if you're enjoying those. Uh, we had Dave Paulson on, Richie McKay, Earl Grant. We also had some deep dives. We had the Memphis and Ohio State deep dive uh, most recently. And with this, I'm also going to pair it with a feature story on Merrimack. So. Uh, kind of framing my thoughts about some of the stuff he said with how they can succeed in D1 right away. So um, definitely check that out on my website, cbbcentral.com. We appreciate you joining us. Again, if you, you like the show, you're, you're new to it, please smash that subscribe button, toss us a five-star rating, give us a nice review, drop a couple words in the comments that you enjoyed the show. It does help others find it. So once again, we appreciate you listening and hope you have a great rest of your week.